too. Okay. Um, quick review. It seems like forever since we've been able to get together. We're uh, trying to get the book of Revelation finished, and tonight we're going to hit chapter 16. A lot of this is left over from the last time we were together. It was a review of where we've been. That's what we did last time we were together. We kind of reviewed some of the things that, uh, that happened in the book of Revelation up to the point of chapter 15, where we see the scene in heaven before the end, quote unquote, the end. We've been to the threshold of the end. We're right up to the end. And now we're going to see the end. Uh, and we see pictures of the temple in heaven. Uh, angels standing before the temple. They're standing there with bowls of wrath that God sent them to dump out on the earth, and tonight, if we'll take those papers and pass them on down there before we're in heaven, we're going to talk about the fact that this is probably one of the fastest sequences that we've seen so far, because if you remember back at the seals, um, the seals were what led up to the trumpets, and the seventh trumpet was the seventh seal, it was the, uh, the seventh seal was the seventh trumpet, and then the seventh trumpet happened and had this big long interlude. Uh, before we got to the place where we are now, where we actually see the seven seals being, or the seven bowl, plug bowls of plague being poured out on the earth. So, this, according to the first line on your paper there, chapter 16 of the book of Revelation is the most tragic part of John's whole vision. Now, if you remember, God used the seals and the trumpets and the things that happened during those times to try to draw people to himself. He spent all the time since Jesus resurrected from the dead using his grace, mercy, and his love to try to get people to follow him. Then they began to see um, some of the wrath that was happening in the earth to try to draw people's hearts back close to God. But what do we find? They just keep moving further and further and further away from God. Because people are either going to receive God or they're going to fight against God. And We've come to a point where there's not going to be any opportunity for them to come to Christ. So let's take a look here. We're going to read through chapter 16, and then we're going to come back and unpack it. All right? Um, then I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So the first angel left the temple, and he poured out his bowl on the earth, and the horrible and malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs, and they became blood. And I heard the angel, who had authority over all the water, saying, You are just, O Holy One, who is and who always was, because you've set these judgments, since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink, it is their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. Then the fourth angel poured out the bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins or turn to God and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and their sores. But they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings of the east could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who are great as those who are watching me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers of their armies and placed uh, to a place in Hebrew called Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne in the temple, saying, It is finished. Then thunder crashed and rolled, and lightning flashed, and a great earthquake struck. The worst since people were placed on the earth. The great city of Babylon into three, uh, into three sections, and the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins, and he made her drink the cup that was filled with wine of his fierce wrath. And every... Island disappeared, and all the mountains were leveled, and there was terrible hailstorm, and hailstones weighing as much 
As 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below, they cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstones. Wow! Man, talk about machine gun activity that's going on here. So let's go back up to the top of your paper there. God's complete undiluted wrath is about to fall on all who have worshipped the beast and refused to honor God. Because we read that this was going to be the undiluted wrath of God. What spot was that? Uh, I was on line two of your paper there. I already gave you line one. The revolution is the most tragic part of John's entire vision. God's complete undiluted wrath is about to fall on those who have worshipped the beast and have refused to honor God. And all the restraint of the earlier visions is gone. Let's look back at chapter 6 real quick. Chapter 6 is where we saw the seals, right? Let's look at chapter 6. We're going to start with verses 5 through 8. It says, When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come, and I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat, uh, bread for three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay, and don't waste the olive oil and the wine. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come, and I looked up and I saw a horse whose color was pale green, its rider was named Death. And his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and with wild animals. So as we see there, saved the oil, and only a fourth of the earth could be was to be affected, right? Not what we read in chapter 16. Then we look at chapter 8, verses 7 through 12. And as we look at chapter 8, verses 7 through 12, we see the trumpets of judgments, Verse 7, the first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down to the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire, one third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. Then the second angel blew his trumpet with a great mountain, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water became blood, one third of all things that lived in the sea died, one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. Now, here we are in chapter 16. Everything that's wet is going to be affected. All fresh water, all salt water, everything. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. And then we find uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 21, which is the locusts and the demonic things that came up from the abyss that only affected the people who, did, who had the mark of the beast. They weren't allowed to die even though they were stung. Uh, and they blasphemed against God. And so as we see this, some were killed, some weren't. And now we're in chapter 16. And God's righteous judgment will be sure, literal, and actual. Okay? This is not rhetorical in, in its presentation. It is not maybe, might be, could be, should be, ought to be. It is going to be. Does that make sense to everybody? And again, here's the question. I was listening to a guy today who could take any scripture in the Bible and show you how it proves that the church is not going to be here for any part of this. On a Calvary Chapel, 97.1, listening to those guys. They always have a way to drag it in to say, we're not going to have to worry about this. We're not going to have to deal with any of this. We're not even going to see this. It's all going to be done after we're gone. Well, if that's the case, then why do we need to know about it? Exactly. Why do we need to know about it? Who is going to help people find Christ? And, of course, they're stuck on that's going to be 144,000 young Jewish virgin men. And we've already debunked that. Okay? And so, as we look at this passage of Scripture here, verse 1, there's a command to commence the rapid succession of the bowls of wrath on sin and evil. I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. Okay? In other words, all of you go and do it now. Go. They're set free. They're not under restraint like they were in chapter 15. They're not, uh, everybody that follows Christ has learned the words of the song um, that, we led, that we read last week. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. 
And as we see that and we know that we have the presence of God there with the temple, then that angel, the mighty voice says, go. It comes from the temple where God exists. Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. And then in verse 2, we immediately see the second, the first bowl. It says, the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth. And horrible, malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Hmm. Why? Why only them? Because God's people are protected. God's people have been protected from the demons that came up out of the pit, from the locusts that came up out of the pit. God has protected his people. God's people, ever since chapter 7, have been in God's protection and everything that's happened all around them to people who are not believers. And God is saying, okay, if you want to worship the beast, here, see if he can help you with this. Gives me who's supposed to think about it. I'm kind of confused about that. If, if people are being tortured and are accepting of, and still <coughs> refuse, what's wrong? What's wrong with them? The sin inside of them. The heart of man is exceedingly wicked. And some people, no matter how much you tell them the truth, no matter how, it's just like what we were talking about this morning. People buy into an ideology that is not God's ideology, and there is not a piece of dynamite big enough to blow them out of that towards God. And so, since God can't win them over with kindness, compassion, love, grace, and mercy, and offer of his forgiveness and the hope for eternity, then he allows things to happen in their lives where they have the chance to ask him for help. And that's really going to be intense when it comes to this because, you know, think about it. When those locusts came up out of the pit, they could bite people and the demons that had the scorpion tail could bite people, but they couldn't die. They were in horrible, exceeding pain and they still cursed God for it because Satan is always going to have an alternative answer. See, that's who God is. Look, God's horrible. Look what God's, Look how good I make it for you. Look how God makes it horrible for you. And people will listen to that because he's the expert at lies. They do it right now. They're doing it right now, politically, everywhere we look. You know, we, the earth is going to end in 12 years. That's why we've got to quit making and gasoline God. and petroleum products and we don't need coal. We need to live off air and solar and all that kind of stuff. Well, Everything that we know about is going away if petroleum goes away. All the power plants that we have in the United States are going to close down if we don't have coal to run. So what are we looking at? They won't build nuclear because they're afraid of nuclear. And so what do we have? We have no options except they keep making a lie up every day to change what the lie was they told yesterday. And that's how Satan works. And the sad thing about it is even people, you know, Bert and I were talking about the fact it's not just one group. They both jump in there together on a lot of this stuff. And so they're, they're, they're doing the devil's work. And they either don't know it or they don't care about it. But when people start worshiping Satan and when they start worshiping the beast and false prophet and all that kind of stuff, because if you remember, the false prophet demands false worship. And when the false worship happens, there's false miracles, there's everything else that fools people into believing that the falsehood is what's real. There's a lot of people out there worshiping Satan right now. And well, they, and, and, and they open, they lock, they don't hide anymore like they used to. That's what it comes to some things like what we were talking about. Twenty years ago, ten years ago, if you were gay, you did it, you kind of hid it, and just kept it to yourself. Or if you were all this other baloney that they're throwing out there now, they're just trying to normalize. But see, that goes back to the late 1960s yeah. with the feminist movement. The feminist movement opened the door for everything that's going today. And here's the problem. Now, now it's coming back to bite them because all these transgender people and men can have babies and men can get pregnant. Well, what's that do to women's rights? You know, they opened the door of Pandora's box and now all the demons are running loose. And that's what's going on. And, and here, what we find here is people will curse God the God who offers them salvation. The God who offers them grace. The God who offers them mercy. 
The God who sent His Son to die on the cross so their sins could be forgiven. And they could spend eternity with Him. They fight against God, just like we read about today in Romans chapter 1 when we were in our sermon this morning. You know, they, they denied God and they came up with crazy ideas of what God was like. And God said, okay, if you don't want to believe in me, fine. Fine. I'm not going to force myself on you. And God's still not forcing Himself on anybody with this. He's just showing what it looks like when they don't belong to him. Because why would we hear that it's only poured out on the people who follow the beast if there's nothing for them to compare with with those who follow Christ? That's going to make it doubly worse because they're going to see their neighbors who belong to God are not getting these sores all over them. They're not getting this stuff going on. It's only them. And it says, as we read through this chapter, that Satan starts to use that stuff to gather people against God to go and fight against God at the final battle of Armageddon. And people will sign up to fight against God, who is the ruler of the universe, the creator. They're going to fight against God. It's like a bunch of ants taking on an elephant. (laughs) It doesn't work unless the elephant's dead. And God's not dead. He's surely alive. Isn't he? He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, just like we sang about this morning. And if we don't have people out there sharing the fact that there's a day coming, a horrible day, after a whole lot of bad days, that people are going to have to deal with this stuff and turn their back on God, then there are going to be a lot more people who are going to turn their back on God. And that's why we always have to be willing to give uh, the, uh, the reason for our hope. Well, let's look at verse 3. Now, let's back up here. The first bowl says ulcers and malignant sores similar to plague number six on the Egyptians. What did we say in the book of Revelation? It mirrors what was going on with the plagues that God put on the Egyptians to let his people go. So the first bowl is ulcers and malignant sores. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 9 real quick. Exodus chapter 9 because that's where God was trying to get his people out of the land of Egypt. And he was... Providing all kinds of reasons for Pharaoh to let the people go. And Pharaoh kept saying no. So let's look at chapter 9, verses 10 through 11. Um, let's, let's just back up to verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from brick kiln, and have Moses toss it in the air while Pharaoh watches. The ashes will spread out like fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, causing festering boils to break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from the brick kiln and went and stood before Pharaoh. As Pharaoh watched, Moses threw the soot into the air, and the boils broke out on people and animals alike. Even the magicians were unable to stand stand before Moses because the boils had broken out on them and all the Egyptians. Again, God has shown that he's stronger than the dark magic that's out there that's available Back when Moses was there, because if you remember, Moses laid his stick down on the ground, and the magicians were able to mimic that. It's going to be the same exact thing when the Antichrist comes. He's going to mimic the miracles of God. But here's what we see. They can't stop the boils. Nothing the enemy can do can stop this from happening. And it says, um, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And just as the Lord had predicted to Moses, Pharaoh refused to listen. Why aren't the people of Israel affected by this? Only the Egyptians. Remember, the people of Israel were over in Goshen, being protected by God's hand for all these plagues, except the plague of the firstborn. But that's when they had to do Passover, where they had to kill the lamb and put the blood on the doorposts. Okay? So the first bowl is the same as the sixth plague on the Egyptians. And then in verse 3 of chapter 16 of Revelation, we see the second bowl. Then the angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. What do you know about the blood of a corpse? Does anybody know what the blood of a corpse does? It hardens. It coagulates and it stinks, and it becomes putrid, right? Um, if you've seen it, if you've ever been around a dead body, we know that when rigor mortis sets in, all the blood pools at the bottom. So if it's laying on its face, all the blood's this way. If it's laying on its back, all the blood's towards the back. Okay? Um, and so this is similar to the very first plague in Egypt, 
which is Exodus chapter 7. So turn to Exodus chapter 7. We're going to read about it in Exodus. Exodus chapter 7, verses 7 through 21. Actually, um, okay, we're going to just give you a little backstory. All right, Moses and Aaron are just leaving God. This is where they do the snake into the or the stick into the serpent. And then verse seven, Moses was eighty years old, and Aaron was eighty-three when they made their demands to Pharaoh. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. When he does this, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. God's power is stronger than evil, right? And Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen, just as the Lord predicted. And then in verse 14, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, and he still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes to the river. Stand on the bank of the Nile and lead him there. Be sure to take along the staff that turned into a snake. Then announce to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, Let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. Until now you refuse to listen to him. So this is what the Lord says, I will show you that I am the Lord. Look, I will strike the water of the Nile with the staff in my hand, and the river will turn to blood. The fish will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink the water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff, raise your hand over the waters of Egypt, call on its rivers, canals, ponds, and reservoirs, turn all the water to blood. Everywhere in Egypt the water will turn to blood, even the water stored in wooden bowls and stone pots. So God's going to give them what to drink? Blood. blood. Just exactly like in chapter 16, in verse 20. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them, as Pharaoh... And all his officials watched. Aaron raised the staff, struck the water, and now suddenly the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died. The water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. Think about that. This is what's happening. Same thing in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. Now, unlike chapter 8, verse 9 where only a third of the sea was affected, the entire sea is affected, and everything in it dies here. It says in verse 3 of chapter 16, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. Everything. Okay? No restraint on God's wrath. None. Now, as we look at Verses 4 through 7 of Revelation chapter 16, we see the third bowl. Now look at this. First bowl, everybody that believes in the demon and worships the demons and, and the, the Antichrist, all affected with these festering bowls that won't go away. They're very, very painful. Immediately after that, what would you think you would do if you felt bad like that? What do you want to do? You want to wash that, right? Second angel pours out the, 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 the bowl and the Salt water is immediately rancid. Third bowl, third angel, verses 4 through 7. Let's look what it says. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs, and they became blood. And I heard the angel had authority over all water, saying, <clears throat> You are just, Holy One, O Holy One, who is and who always was, because you have sent these judgments, since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. So, what we see here is the freshwater sources, which is the springs and the rivers, are polluted similarly to plague one, which we just read about in Egypt. And if you remember, the plague went further than just the freshwater it was all the captured fresh water. So, you know, a lot of people keep jugs of water and bottles of water around the house. Even that is no longer fit to drink because it's turned blood. Think about that. 
You can go for 40 days without food. But you can only go to three days without water before your body starts breaking down. Three. And after a week without water, you become so dehydrated, you begin to hallucinate, and you have no strength, and you can't do anything. Now, we read this and we say, well, the water turns to blood. Well, the ramifications of that are bigger than what we're thinking about. <laughs> you know, they, they affect every aspect of life. Because now the pets can't have something to drink, and you can't have something to drink. And the livestock can't have something to drink. And if you don't have livestock drinking, you don't have steak and hamburger and pork chops and eggs and chicken and milk and all that stuff. Everything burns water. Right. Everything, and we're, what are we? We're 70% water. 70% water. So, as we look at this, the angel continues to say, God, you're just in what you're doing. And some people would say, but God's horrible, he's mean. He's terrible. No, God's patient. And he's slow to anger. But when we get to this part of Revelation, God is pouring out the anger. He's done being patient. Okay? So the fresh water is essential for all human life. That's the first blank there, underneath the second blank underneath the third bowl. And in verses 5 through 6, we see the logic of the plagues. This is very logical. This is not capricious. Capricious meaning God saying, well, I don't like you, so I'm going to hurt you. Uh, or I like you better than you, so I'm going to do good things for you and not for you. It shows the logic behind it. And the logic is God's justice and God's righteous judgment. Because they've shed the blood of your holy people, your prophets. Okay? I don't know if you've ever read Hebrews chapter 11. But it talks about the fact that some of God's prophets were sawn apart, they were torn apart. If we know anything about what happened in the first three centuries of the Roman Empire, they were martyred by being burned at the stake, fed to the lions, put into gladiatorial competitions where they had to fight for their life, and they were slaughtered. And God's people are being killed at a faster rate over the last hundred years than they were in the previous thousand years before that. And so we have these souls under the altar saying what? How long, Lord? How long till you get your righteous revenge on these people? How long till you avenge us? And the Lord tells them in chapter 6, just wait a little while. Well, a little while is now. Right here in chapter 16, all hell is breaking loose on the earth. And there's nothing anybody can do to overcome it. Nothing. Nobody can stop it. Okay? The blood to drink is the just reward for the shed blood of the prophets and the saints. And the saints include all true followers of God. Here it refers to the martyrs of the faith. People who were killed because they spoke the truth. Okay? Because they relayed what God wanted. And it's fast. And, it's, and there's no stopping it. And it continues to gain speed and it continues to affect more and more of what's going on in the world. Now let's look at verse 7. I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. And this voice from the altar where the souls of the martyr wait God's judgment are the ones who are saying that. We saw them in chapter 6, we saw them in chapter 14, and we saw them in chapter 19, and we'll see them again in chapter 19. And it's a statement of approval. They are approving of what God's doing. Because it's right. But here's the deal. Have you ever met people who tell their kids, if you do that, I'm going to spank you. If you do that, I'm going to spank you. If you do that, I'm going to spank you. And they never do! A lot of people think that God's never going to spank them. But you see, God is not okay with sin. God is slow to anger. God is patient. God will do what He determines is the right thing to do when He determines it's the right thing to do. Okay? That's why sometimes when we pray and ask God for things, He does not give them to us. Because he knows they will damage us. Right? 
And sometimes God does give things to us that we shouldn't have to show us that we shouldn't have them. And sometimes says God, wait. Just wait. And what's the worst thing for us to do? Wait. We want to know. We need it now. That's why we need 24 hour around the clock news. Because we can't wait till tomorrow. I can remember when I was a kid, 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock. That was when you watched the news. And that's the way it is today. Right? Remember Walter Conkright saying that. That's the way it is today. And then you give the date. Well, we can't even wait for tomorrow to know what's going on. We can't wait to hear what's happening. But let me tell you what, when this starts happening, people are going to wish time would slow down. They're going to wish they had a break, could take a breath. Because when God treads the wine press of his undiluted anger, it's going to come like a torrent, like a flood. Okay? Now, this shows the difference in outcomes for those who choose to drink the blood of wrath rather than wear the robes dipped in the blood of the Lamb. God's people are being protected. Okay? There's a difference between those who choose to drink the blood of wrath. Who, are the, who is it? It's the people who are worshiping the false prophet. They're the ones who are dealing with all this stuff. Okay? And now we go to verses 8 through 9, the fourth bowl. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give Him glory. Now, we got to stop right here. This is cosmic upheaval as the sun scorches the followers of the beast. How do I know this is only talking about the followers of the beast? Because it says in this verse, everyone was burned by the blast of the heat and they cursed the name of God. Anybody who belongs to God cannot curse the name of God. Right? So those who belong to God are not affected by this somehow or another. Miraculously, God is protected. Okay? And this cosmic upheaval is the sun scorches the followers of the beast. If you remember back in chapter 6, they were hiding in the rocks because the, the cosmos was affected. Now there's no escaping it for those who follow the beast. They're all going to be burnt. They're going to have the worst sunburn they ever had in their entire life. Hmm. Now, if you've already got boils on you that are festering and burning, and your skin is already raw, and then all of a sudden the sun becomes so intense that you get cooked and get those kind of blisters on you, what kind of relief can you get for that? Solar cane's not going to happen. And they've already been stung by the horse. And they've already been stung by the locusts and, then, and all this stuff. Yeah. Right? And they're still refusing to say, okay, God, I quit, I surrender. Forgive me. Isn't that amazing? How can people be so stubborn? Have you ever had a stubborn kid that you dealt with? That no matter what you did, no matter how many times you spanked them, no matter how many times you told them no, they looked defiantly at you and said, I'm going to do what I want to do. And you can't stop me. And that's what these people are doing to God. They're basically giving God the middle finger and saying, you know, you keep doing this, but I ain't changing my mind. And that's why it says in chapter 3 when Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door and lets me in, we'll have fellowship together. God's knocking pretty hard, isn't he? But there comes a time when God stops knocking and they're just destined for God's wrath. Because people's hearts can become so callous. I mean, there are actually women who are proud of their abortions. Who are marching around now, talking about how proud they are of their abortions. There are celebrities on TV now, talking about how abortion is the best thing that ever happened in their life. Because they ripped the life out of themselves. That was unique unto itself. It was not part of them. And it's not part of the woman's body when she gets pregnant. It's a unique individual. It's not part of her body. It's not a growth inside of her. It's not a tumor. It's not a lump. It's a human being. And they're okay. And they have multiple abortions. They use it like birth control. How can you get that hard? How can any man decide, well, he's not a man, he's an animal, to molest little children? And there's no cure for that. 
There is no cure, none, for people who are pedophiles. The American Psychiatric Association says you cannot rehabilitate a pedophile. Once a pedophile, always a pedophile. It's never going to go away. So what do we do? We have DAs now that turn them loose, and they go right back out and do it again. Because their hearts are hardened, and there's callous on there, and there's evil in them, and sin is rampant in their lives, and, and they just don't care that there's judgment, and they don't care that there's a God. Okay? So as we see, what, you want to say something? Yet. Yet. They don't care yet. They're going to. Right. But as we see this bowl being turned out, everyone is scorched by the fire of the sun. Now, I don't know if that's a solar flare. I don't know what that is. It doesn't tell us. But it says it becomes so hot that it scorches the skin off the people. And they cursed the name of God who had control over the plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give Him glory. Wow. And it breaks God's heart. Because God's not willing that any should perish, but that also have eternal life. And what it boils down to is God will use whatever means necessary to help people realize that they can't exist without Him. They can't. And you know, when people have their skin already affected by these boils, and they don't have water to drink, and then they get scorched by the sun, have you ever watched any of the shows like The Walking Dead or any of those kind of shows? The only reason I watch them is because it shows what people are really like when there's no resources and there's nobody but I gotta survive mentality going on. People will attack each other. They will hurt people. If you remember, if you've ever read the stories of the siege of Israel, or I mean the siege of Judah when they were the Babylonians were about to take the people out of Israel, they were eating their own kids because there was no food. You know, because they're gonna survive one way or another. And the devil always has a way to explain it away. You know, in cases of incest, well, in cases of incest are less than one-tenth of one percent for somebody to end up being pregnant. So they're saying that that has to be there for, for abortion to continue. In cases of rape, you know, in cases of the woman's health, they're all very small, insignificant numbers. But the devil says you got to have abortion on demand. But let me ask you this. If a woman who was raped has, is pregnant, and she gets all the way to the seventh or eighth or ninth month, and then she decides, I want this baby, is it okay to induce labor, to pull that baby's feet out, to turn it around so that it's facing away, to jam a pair of scissors up in the back of its head and cut its spinal cord, and then stick a vacuum in and suck its brains out so the head collapses so you can pull the baby the rest of the way out? Is that okay? What kind of a person can do that? Somebody who believes there's no God. Somebody who worships evil. Somebody who doesn't understand that there are consequences. And these are the people who are going to be affected. And look at verse 10. Um, it says, um, here, did I give you they still curse God for inflicting the pain and they refuse to repent their sins? Now, verse, chapter 16, verses 10 through 11 we get to the fifth bowl. Watch this. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. Now they're in utter and complete darkness. And what's that a picture of? In hell, where there's no torment, or where the torment never ends, right? The fire has scorched them, they have sores, they're in pain, they're in complete darkness. Only those who follow the beast and the antichrist and the false prophet. Them. Only them. Now you would think that when you got to that place, if it was really that bad, you would even consider God as an alternative, wouldn't you? Hey, I'm not quite working out. Maybe there is a God. And maybe I can ask him for forgiveness. But what do they do? It says they curse him. They still curse God. 
So as we look at this, the kingdom of the beast is plunged into darkness, similar to plague 8 in Egypt. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 10, the 8th plague. Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift up your hand toward the heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other, and no one moved. But there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. <laughs> what a comparison. Darkness and light. And think about it. It says it was so dark they couldn't even see each other even if they were in close proximity to one another. A darkness so dark that you could feel it. You know, I can honestly say I've never been anywhere where it was that dark. In the back of the cave, they'll turn on all the lights and you can you, see. Yeah, because you know that the cave is all around you. This is just in the darkness standing outside. They couldn't see. They didn't know. They were groping around. They didn't know which way they were going. They didn't know who was around. They thought they were completely yeah, alone. You can put your hand right here. Right. You can't see a thing. Okay? So, think about that for a minute. They've already got boils on them. They don't have any fresh water to drink. They are scorched by the sun. Right? Now, as we see this, they also... Um, are in such darkness that they can't find anything. Look at the next line there. This darkness is moral and spiritual rather than physical. Okay? It's moral darkness and it's spiritual darkness. And as we see this, John chapter 8 verse 12 talks about that. John chapter 8 verse 12. This is what it says. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. Okay? These people are in such spiritual darkness that it becomes palpable. They can't see anything because of the condition of their morals, the condition of their souls. Let's also look at John chapter 12, verses 35 to 36. John 12, 35 and 36. This is what it says. Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. You hear God saying, walk in the light. I'm the light. Anybody that refuses him refuse, chooses darkness. Okay? Now, darkness for their soul, darkness of this plague that's going to happen. And then, again, in verse 46 of that same chapter, Jesus says, I've come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me, for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be, re will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. Think about that. What's Jesus saying? I'm warning you. I'm warning everybody. Darkness will overtake you. And then as you look at 1 John, which is right there before Revelation, the, the epistle of 1 John, um, we're going to look at verses 2, 9 through 11. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. It says this. If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. What did we read this morning? Not only do the people who turn their back on God sin but they invite other people to sin right along with them. Okay? And as I look in the world 
today. Nancy Pelosi has now been refused by her bishop in the Catholic Church communion. That won't last very long. Because she's a good Catholic as far as the world is concerned. But she's still okay murdering babies all the way up till they're born. Okay? Um, there are people who call themselves Christians who are participating in adultery, who are participating in gossip, who participate in homosexual activities, who cheat, steal, lie, and all those things. And what they do, they try to, they try to justify what they do, and then they try to say that God's going to, God's going to, God's going to forgive me for that one of these days. Come on, it ain't no big deal. Come on. It won't hurt. This is one thing that won't hurt. No big deal. And they won't give you part of their delusion. Right. You know, for some people, all it takes to become an alcoholic is one drink. For some people who become a drug addict, it just takes one toke off of a, one toke off of a joint or one pill or one thing like that, one dose of something. Methamphetamine, you immediately become a drug addict with one taste of it, right? Um, matter of fact, we had a meth addict that lived behind us when we were in Missouri. And I walked out my back door one day and he was walking around on his roof in his underwear. High as a kite. And I noticed there was a bad smell coming from over there. It was about from here over across the street. There was a big yard between us. And I noticed always there was a bad, they found a meth lab in his basement. And he started out with one, one hit of meth. And it became a dealer. And people will invite you to participate in their sin. But you see, when we justify sin, it means we don't belong to God. Because the Holy Spirit, if we belong to God, is going to keep us from sin. Going to help us know, don't do that, right? Well, here we go. We're going to look, this is, we're only going to get to, I guess, the, the fifth bowl tonight. So, as we see this, the great worldwide satanic system of idolatry is thrown into complete darkness and disorder. Remember here? They had it all together. They had the worship of everybody. They were forcing everybody to worship. They were in, they were in control of commerce. You couldn't buy or sell without the mark of the beast, right? And they're, getting, they're paying for it now. The whole system... Is showing, God is showing that the satanic system is not powerful as what he is. And the sad thing is, some people out there believe that Satan is just as powerful as God is, and he's not. He's not. He's a created being. He's created by God. And there's never been a creation that was more powerful than the Creator. Never. Because there's only one Creator, and that's God. And so as we see this plague and all this stuff that's going on, we see that they just wouldn't change their minds. And all who are participants experience utter chaos. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness and his subjects ground their teeth. In anguish they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and their sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. When something's plunged into darkness, it's plunged into chaos. Okay? In verse 11, they again refuse to repent. <coughs> There's nothing on the back of your paper, is there? That's it. That's where we're stopping tonight. I didn't know how much we're doing we would do for the first part. And to get through these five bowls in that little amount of time, do you have any questions over, over what we've talked about here? Remember, in the plague of darkness in Egypt, the people of Christ, God still had light. When this plague of darkness is going on, the people of God still have light. Because Jesus is light, right? Yeah. All right, guys. I really want to get this Bible study done. So next weekend is Memorial Day weekend. One more weekend where people plan stuff. I'm going to be teaching this Bible study next Sunday night, whether anybody's able to be here or not. So you'll have to watch it on Facebook if you can't make it. That's the way it is for everybody on Facebook, for everybody too. here. Um, because we've got to get through this. We've been doing this since October of last year, if you'll remember. And between COVID and between holidays and between people being sick and me being sick and, and, and Mother's Day and, and Father's Day is coming up in a couple weeks. And, you know, it just seems like we've hit that time of the year where every two or three weeks there's some kind of a holiday some kind of a reason. And plus, people are going to be going on vacation. And people are going to be doing stuff because the kids get out of school in another two weeks. 
Um, and people are going to be doing and going. So I'm going to be teaching this Bible study every week, every Sunday, till we're done. Um, you may have to watch it on Facebook because I don't want to drag this out all summer long because we, you know, two or three people can't make it this time and one person, you know, can't make it next time. We're going to do it, and that's the way it's going to be. And if you can't, you'll be able to go back on Facebook and watch it. It's going to be recorded, and um, we're going to we're going to get through this. Otherwise, we're going to wait till the fall and finish it up. And I don't want to wait till the fall and finish it up because I want to start something new, maybe. So I hope that you will uh, share what you're learning with somebody else. Did you learn anything tonight that you didn't know already? What's learned tonight that you didn't know already? That's one of the things I like to ask. What did we learn? You know, I've said a lot of stuff, and and what what do you what did you take out of this tonight? I take out that the people, no matter how. No matter how much they're going through and pulling under and getting all this stuff happening to them, they're still going. Once they've truly determined in their heart yeah. to be God's opponent, they're going to be God's opponent till the end. Yeah, and I'm still kind of surprised after even after all the other. All the other things that have happened. Yeah. It's like a hand shaking its fist at all. Yeah. Right? It's like you realize that it's just like the people that are out there right now. Right. It's, 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 you, these people are here right now. They're the same people who refuse to see what's going on. Yeah, but some of the people who are here right now can be convinced. Right. Oh, yeah. At this yeah, point, so I'm saying, at this point, point, they're not going to be convinced. At this point, you can like literally see the difference. In the you can see the seeds that are planted, can't you? Yeah. yeah. You can see the open resistance against God. Yeah, you can just, see the past five, ten years has just kind of opened up everybody's eyes to you. No, we're not trying to hide it anymore. This is where it's at. Everybody's People are sending right out in the open and nobody's saying a word about it. It's all right there. But we're going to say a word about it or more. Um, you know, I'm not going to be okay sitting back watching it happen. And, and I've never been. Anybody that's been around this church long knows that I'm always speaking against what's going on in the world. Yes. That just seems like it's like God's had enough at this point. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. That was, what, that was what happened there in chapter God's, 15. Yeah, God's had enough. <laughs> yeah, chapter 15. Uh, actually, chapter 14. The end of chapter 14. An angel came from the temple in heaven. He had a sharp sickle. Another angel who had power to destroy with fire came from the altar. He shouted to the angel with the sharp sickle, Swing your sickle now. Gather the clusters of grapes from the vines on the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. And the grapes were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press in a stream about 180 miles long, and as high as a horse's bridle. We can't even put that into our minds and contemplate it. 180 miles long and that deep. But it doesn't say how wide, right? We only get two dimensions. And so what it's talking about is the complete full wrath of God. And it's going to be such that everyone's going to see it and everyone's going to know about it. There's not going to be anything hidden. Well, there's a really crazy, like, overall, through the whole religion, through the whole Christian religion and all that, blood is like, blood is like the key to everything. Well, sure, the Bible, the Old Testament says they have to sacrifice an animal because the life is in the blood. Yeah, and a life has to be given to cover the sin. And that's why Jesus is the once for all sacrifice. And that's why we sing songs like this one, and there's power in blood. It's always, in, it's always about the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. The if you don't have any blood in your life, in your body, you can't sustain life. Right. right? And the blood of Christ covers all the sins of everybody who will receive that. Yeah. And it's not it's the, just limited in that. Everybody who opens their hearts and receives Christ is washed in his blood. And that's why I read those passages from John that talk about we have to choose life. We have to choose against the darkness. And Jesus says anybody who doesn't choose light automatically chooses darkness. But let me tell you, there are some people out there who have done some pretty awful, horrible things in their lives who can still be convinced to come to Christ. And there are some very fine, good people who have never even hardly done anything bad in their life. They've never had a mean, a mean thought about anybody who also need to find Christ. Because if they don't find Christ, they're going to have boils all over them at some point. The fire's going to scorch them. They're not going to have anything to drink. And they're going to be plunged into darkness. And that's people that we know and we care about. People that we love. Our kids. Our neighbors. Our friends. Our relatives. People we work with. 
And that's why this book is written to show that there is hope that we don't have to go through those things because to choose Christ is to choose hope for eternity. To choose Christ is to choose light. To choose against Christ is to choose a hopeless eternity separated from God in darkness where there is maggots that never die, the worm never dies, and the fire is never quenched. And the the pain is horrible. Horrible. Okay? So, basically, these people who are worshiping the beast are getting the first taste of what they're going to spend the turn doing. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? God warns people, and they still don't listen. It's like when you tell a little kid, if you got a candle burning, don't put your hand over the flame. But they're just like a moth. They're just like a butterfly. They're drawn to the flame. Ah! I told you, don't put your hand over the flame. Right? God's warning. God's telling. God's telling. Don't, don't, don't. Or this is going to be the outcome. Right? And people are so hard-headed and hard-hearted that they're still going to test it. They're still going to try and they still believe they're smarter than God like we talked about this morning. And they will do this. Yep, they will. All right, well, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time together. We thank you that as we look at these things that John has written in um, Revelation, it is kind of sort of scare people to help people realize that there's coming kind of things on this earth that nobody wants to be a part of, and the only way to have protection against God's wrath is to belong to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we see that you've always protected your people in the midst of what you did in Egypt, and we know that you'll protect your people in the midst of what's going to happen towards the end. And Father, I pray that we would be open to your spirit, that we would be open to your calling, that we would be open to your heart for us, and that we would surrender our bodies, our minds, our souls, our strength to you, that we would open our mouths and allow you to put the words in them to help people understand what a great, mighty, and awesome God you are. And Father, we thank you that you give us the ability to overcome. We thank you that the promises that Jesus made to him who perseveres or overcomes, I will give this, this, and this. And Father, those are the rewards that we're receiving in your kingdom that we'll take and turn around and lay down right at your feet as we worship you and thank you for your protection, for your guidance, for your hand at work in our lives. Lord, help us to always be willing to give a reason for the hope that lies within us with gentleness and respect. And I pray, God, that you would help us to find a person who's looking for answers so that we can tell them about you so that they can escape the clutches of evil and the possibility of eternal damnation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.